Yes, it is. Um, so great to be here, and thank you uh, for, your, uh, for your help on everything. I'm going to talk fast because we really want to hear from David uh, Ludwig here. And I hear his wife Dawn had some not inconsequential uh, thing to do with the book, too. Yes, it's fantastic. Um, and I've also brought my friend, though, the Prezi, to help me walk through this talk. Um, I love it because, for me, kind of crawling through the underbelly of the trillion dollar processed food industry was like you know, being inside a detective story. So I, I fell in love with these little Sherlock Holmes footprints uh, in, in the Prezi. Um, in 2002, the food giant Nestle paid $2.6 billion for that frozen microwavable delicacy called the Hot pocket, arguably one of the least healthy items in the grocery store and a poster child for, let's say, exuberant snacking. Five years later, Nestle bought a canned drink that addresses one of the grimmest corners of overeating. Every year in the United States, some 200,000 people um, have their stomachs surgically shrunk to help them lose weight, and this is the drink that helps them live going forward. Get them fat, get them thin, gorge on hot pockets, eat through a straw. Page 337 of uh, the book Salt, Sugar, Fat. That's not the book, sorry. The book Salt, Sugar, Fat. I'm sorry, I always have to show that because I, I laugh when I see it. The, the design was by a Russian emigre in New York who, when he kind of leafed through the book, went into his grocery store, grabbed all his favorite foods he hated to love, and literally just ripped out the letters to rearrange the ingredients to express what was really going on inside these products, which of course kind of was what the book is about. So, Imagine my surprise now two summers ago when I got a call from none other than the folks at the fabulous headquarters of Nestle in Lake Geneva wanting me to come to give a keynote to their private meeting of 60 research and development of leaders from around the country. Um, these are the people who invented and nurtured Nestle's 29 billionaire brands, as they call them. The company may have started out with infant formula, but as one of their scientists quipped to me, it is now a Swiss bank that prints food. Um, and because I had to pay my own way, uh, the, uh, my oldest son, who's heading off to college, goes, Dad, I hope you're not going to like spend my money on a round trip ticket to Switzerland, because they're going to drop you off the Matterhorn. <laughs> but, 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 but they had a new head of the research and development uh, 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 division who assured me they wouldn't do that. They were trying to turn a leaf. They read the book. They loved it. But they needed to hear all the bad things that they had done in order to motivate them to start doing good things. So I went. I brought my son with me as a bodyguard, actually. <laughs> he had a good time at the Nestle uh, Chocolate Factory. Um, and, uh, and this was the crowd, actually, who I gave a talk to. Um, it was the full 90-minute double barrel talk, which I'm not going to hit you with today. But these are the Cliff Notes versions of what, a version of what I said to them. Um, in 2008, I was actually in Algeria writing about Islamic terrorists. I had spent, after 9-11, um, time going to Iraq, writing about the war in Iraq, the spread of terrorism throughout the Middle East. I got in some trouble, had to come back to the United States, and my editor at the time said to me, hey, Michael, what do you think about writing about peanuts? And I look at Christine like she's out of her mind, right? I'm trying to sell her some story about nuclear arms sales. She goes, oh, no, no, think about it. There's been an outbreak of salmonella in peanuts. Um, these are, this is not junk food. These are things that people or parents are giving their little kids because they're good for them. 
They're being manufactured here in the US of A. We can't blame China for this one. And they're being used as ingredients by this trillion dollar processed food industry about which we really know very little. These are the base notes that get investigative journalists all excited. So I went down to Georgia, spent some time, and indeed it became a story of the food industry losing control over its ingredients because weeks and weeks were going by and the companies using the peanuts in hundreds of products were still trying to figure out if indeed they were using these products and recalling hundreds and hundreds of brands as people were dying and getting sick eventually in 43 states. And my reporting on pathogens next took me to Minneapolis, Minnesota. I was incredibly lucky to come across a trove of documents that allowed me for the first time to tell the story of the making of a single hamburger contaminated by E. coli that ended up paralyzing Stephanie Smith here, but it opened a window on the meat industry, which in this case was intentionally losing control over its ingredients um, in order to avoid trace back for costly recalls. And I was having dinner um, in Seattle one night with one of my best meat industry sources, Mansoor, who tests meat for, um, for pathogens, when he said to me, you know, Michael, as, as tragic as these incidents are, you really should take a look at something my industry, he's talking about the meat industry, is intentionally adding to its products over which it has absolute control. He was worried about salt, but then I started looking at sugar and fat comes into it as, as well. And boy, was he right. I mean, that was now 2010. Um, the obesity rate now in the United States uh, just hit 38%. Um, type 2 diabetes is up in the 20s of millions with a lot more with prediabetes. Gout, the last time I looked, is at 8 million. And, you know, really, the first problem I had as a reporter was that, I mean, we've always known that eating too much of this stuff can make us too overweight and otherwise unhealthy. But again, I was lucky to come across a mountain of internal documents that put me at the table of the largest food giants as they were formulating marketing designing, selling their products, and the overwhelming sense of that material, which then also led me to find and interview key people in the industry who came to have substantial misgivings about their life work. The overwhelming sense of that is that they're driving day and night to get us not just to like their products, but to want more and more of them. And it's not like I see this industry as this evil empire that's intentionally set out to make us overweight or otherwise ill. I mean, these are companies doing what all companies want to do, which is make as much money as possible by selling as much product as possible. The problem lies in their deep dependence on using gobs of salt, sugar, fat to make their products low cost, convenient, and utterly irresistible. I was, um, Incredibly fortunate to spend time with a legend in the industry. His name is Howard Moskowitz, trained in high math and then experimental psychology at Harvard. He's responsible for a good many of the biggest icons in the grocery store doing what he calls engineering. Howard walked me through um, his recent creation of a new soda flavor for Dr. Pepper, in which he started with no less than 61 different versions of sweetness, each one just slightly different than the next, subjected those to 3,000 consumer taste tests around the country, took the data, threw it in his computer, and out came the high regression analysis um, data where um, you typically have a curve like this that you might get in school, except that the top of the curve is not the dreaded middle C. It's what Howard coined the term for the bliss point for sweetness. Not too little, not too much. Anybody who likes sugar in their coffee, anybody here, can do the bliss point test yourself. You just keep adding sugar till you get to the point where it sends you over the moon and a little bit too much, and you're gonna start going, yuck. Well, the problem is not that the companies have, have deployed engineers like Howard. Um, to make things like ice cream and soda and cookies sweet. The problem is for that nutritionists would tell you is that 
the food companies have marched around the store adding sugar to things that didn't used to be sweet before. So now bread has added sugar and a bliss point for sweetness. Yogurt can still have as much sugar per serving as ice cream. One of my favorite spots in the grocery store to marvel at is the spaghetti sauce aisle where some brands can have the equivalent of a couple of Oreo cookies worth of sweetness in a tiny half cup serving. And what this does is create this expectancy that everything should taste sweet. And this is especially hard for kids who are hardwired for the sweet taste. So when you drag their little butts over to the produce aisle and try to get them to eat some of that other stuff we should be eating more of, and they get some of those other basic tastes that Aristotle wrote about way back when, the bitter and the sour, you're going to get a rebellion on your hands. Um, and I had so much fun with the people in, in um, the food industry um, explaining to me all that went into their products. And, I, you know, and one of my favorites, certainly, to think about on the subway when I'm headed home is none other, of course, than the potato chip. We know, of course, that what is the very first, if I could have one of my interns, please, sample one of these lovely Utz's from Pennsylvania. Just put it in your mouth. I love the hat. Yeah. <laughs> On the tongue, what's the first sensation you get? Salt. Ah, salt. The flavor burst is what the industry called salt. It's usually the first thing that touches your uh, saliva, hits the taste bud, sends that signal to the reward centers of the brain, which send back that signal of pleasure, saying what to you? More, yes, that's what I would say. Maybe you're not a big <laughs> potato chip fan. But what I didn't know, oh, so and also potato chips are by design 50% uh, fat. Fat the industry calls the mouthfeel. It's the sensation of biting into a warm toasted cheese sandwich. And they don't even need to bother your taste buds for that because we all have the trigeminal nerve that comes down to the roof of our mouth, which will pick up that sensation and send that also to the reward centers of our brain. Um, what I didn't know, though, was that the simple potato chip is also loaded with sugar. Some brands added sugar, but your basic ordinary potato chip, sugar in the form of potato starch, which gets converted into glucose. Um, uh, into, in, in, in your body, giving you the unholy trinity of salt, sugar, fat, of course. But it's not just that. And I have to say, you know, I'm supposed to follow the money as an investigative reporter, but I totally fell in love with the language that they use to sort of describe the extraordinary science that goes into um, many of their products, like this lovely competitor with the hot pocket for being a poster child. Who's my next victim? Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm glad you're doing this. So just put it in your mouth and press your tongue against the roof of your mouth and tell us, and you don't even have to chew. That's something about processed food. You don't even have to chew it, right? What, what do you get? What happens to it? It, it melts. I swear I didn't prompt that, right? So when, the cheat, when this hard, seemingly solid piece of food melts in your mouth, it sends, the company's learned, a signal to your brain <clears throat> saying that the calories have melted away and disappeared. <laughs> and so they, they coined the term the banishing caloric density, meaning you want the bag, right? There's no problem. You're not going to, there you go. Go for it. No worries at all if you're, if you're worried about your diet. Um, but, you know, and it's, it's, it's more than sort of the extraordinary science of making their products sort of so irresistible. Um, uh, oh, there's my Cheetos, of course, I had the real thing. Excuse the fuzziness. But this is the very first assembly line on that now billion dollar brand called the Lunchables back in the 1980s. I was again really lucky to spend time with the inventor of the Lunchables. I'm not gonna make you guys eat. But did you have Lunchables as a kid? Yeah, all right, right, right. So, and did you, did you what did you love about the Lunchables? Everything, Everything. all right. Well, 
I'm going to tell you what I think you loved about the Lunchables. Here's a, here's a better picture. Um, I was amazed to learn that very on in the creation of the Lunchables, especially when they came up with the pizza Lunchables, that, that, that tray of cold dough and a little bit of cheese and cold sauce that the kid would put together him or herself in the lunchroom when Oscar Mayer and then Kraft that, that, owned the, that owned the brand asked parents whether they thought Johnny and Susie would love the Lunchables. They said, are you out of your mind? Of course they won't love that. But Johnny and Susie loved the Lunchables. And, and at one point, the CEO of the company was sort of famous for saying privately that the reason for that is that the Lunchables isn't about the food as much as it is about the empowerment. When a kid pulls that school bus yellow tray that looks like a gift from his mom or dad for the day out of their bag in the lunchroom, they're the cat's meow. And so Kraft came up with that slogan for kids, all day you gotta do what they say, but lunchtime is all yours. And the brand took off like a rocket due to the incredible marketing skill that the companies have. Um, one of my favorite characters in the book is this guy, Jeffrey Dunn. For 20 years, he was one of the fiercest warriors at this company. Um, he rose to become president of Coca-Cola for North America, South America. Jeffrey walked me through Coke's pioneering of the supersize me phenomena, where you can walk into a restaurant or, and get as much soda as you want for the same price, because frankly, the ingredients are the least, least, amount, of the, least amount of the cost of the product. The warlike language they use to describe people who will eat or drink two, three, or more Cokes a day, in which they don't call them their best customers, but rather heavy users. And their targeting of kids like Tatiana here in a corner store in Philadelphia, knowing that when children walk into a store with a little bit of their own spending money and make that first purchase decision, they will become imprinted and brand loyal. And so the companies practice what they call up and down the street marketing to target those kids and control the real estate um, in those stores. Um, it was, um, and, and they were sort of so confident in their ability to sort of do what they do, the formulation and the marketing, that in 1999, the heads of the largest companies got together for a very private meeting in Minneapolis again in the old Pillsbury headquarters, brought there by a cabal of insiders in their companies who became increasingly concerned about their growing culpability not just over obesity, this is one of the slides that one of those uh, officials uh, who got up on the stage showed the CEOs of the companies, the March of Obesity around the United States, but also diabetes, gout. He started linking collectively their products to several types of cancers. And he pleaded with the company officials to start doing something collectively to turn the corner, reformulate their products, think about their marketing, in order to, to serve the consumer in a healthier way. And he sat down and up stood one of the most powerful people in the room who was livid and explained to Michael Mudd, the, 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 the executive from Kraft who was giving this presentation, that look, we're already sensitive to consumers, beholden if you will, um, if they want a low salt product, we've got it on the shelf there. If they want a low fat product, we're making that for them too. We're adding whole grain, doing this, calcium, whatever. But you have to understand that we're also beholden to investors and there is no way we're going to mess around with the company jewels, as he called them, referring to salt, sugar, fat, if that's going to diminish sales. And so, I finished my talk, yes, Lee. I got some polite uh, applause. <laughs> and then for the next three days, which is really why I wanted to be there, I sort of swam around with their 350 PhDs who are hard at work re-engineering their products now to finally respond to that growing concern of people about what they're putting in their bodies. Um, and so they usually sort of impress me with their work uh, on salt, for example. They're taking it out of the inside of products and putting it on the top. <laughs> with 
fat, they're taking the globule and trying to increase the surface area for more mouthfeel bang for their buck. Um, and sugar, of course, they're turning to non-caloric sweeteners in hopes that we'll still get that bliss point appeal, irresistible allure for fewer calories. Um, and as a result, the hot pocket that I've been picking on here, no doubt, is a healthier item in, in the grocery store. But, but oh good, I'm, I'm glad I put that there to remind you. A confession <laughs> on my part. As, as much as I've harped about salt, sugar, fat, as, as, as helping to get us into the problem we're in now with food, when you go out and talk to nutritionists, <clears throat> reducing salt, sugar, fat often isn't the first thing on their mind. And we'll hear what's on their mind probably from David here in a minute. But, but one of the things that they said to me anyway first on their mind is getting us to eat more of this stuff. Um, in fact, double this, the amount that we're eating now. On the notion that we can sort of fill up half our plates with, um, with fruits and vegetables, the other stuff will gradually kind of start taking care of itself if we can wean ourselves over. So I went back to my food giants kind of with this question, and excuse the possessive, I feel a little possessive of them, being the unofficial torturer of them these days, but, um, but with this question, so what would they do if they were suddenly tasked with selling vegetables? And of course, the, the cynics among us would go, well, they'd smother them in cheese sauce or caramel glazing, but no, if the rule was they couldn't ruin the nutritional profile, um, and I think they would do three things, which is sort of did with their processed food products. I think they would go back to the farmers and say, hey guys, remember how we told you to plant the entire United States in field corn for high fructose corn syrup and, and, and cattle feed and ethanol? Well, we now want you to switch over to grow fruits and vegetables. And indeed, in the Midwest, there is a very, very tiny number of sons and daughters of field corn farmers who are now switching over to growing fruits and vegetables. I think the second thing, the two that they would do is they would go into the grocery store and say, hey guys, remember how we told you to turn the grocery store into this like la la land where people would lose the sense of their self as they went shopping in order to sort of get us, help us get them to make impulse decisions on what they would buy. I think they would start doing things like this, putting coolers at the checkout that sell Coca not Coca-Cola, but rather the vegetables, and also using things like nudge marketing to um, help people make better decisions. I, 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 love, I, I love this shot because this is an experiment being done in El, El Paso, which has a huge uh, food problem these days, where the scientists um, were manipulating with the grocery cart. The first thing they did is they put some duct tape down the middle of it, and the front of the cart, the front half, they put a little sign saying, put your fruits and vegetables in the front half of the cart, and within a week, they doubled sales of fruits and vegetables. Just with that little nudge on their part. Well, this was the other idea they had was, they said, well, look, if the store is designed to get us to leave our sense of ourself at the door so we'll buy impulsively, and that's typically junk. What if we reminded people of who they are? And so they put these little mirrors in the cart. And that in indeed is the, is, the, is, the, is the impression of the gentleman pushing the cart. But I loved him because he goes, he was helpful. And he goes, you know guys, and the mirror's kind of rectangular, he goes, you know what would really work is if you turn the mirror this way so I could see this part of my body, which indeed was very, very ample. Um, but I think, I think what the industry would really do, um, and I have a little video coming up here next to, to, to help with this, um, is they would turn to their advertising geniuses on Madison Avenue who sell their junk and get them to find a way to sell vegetables. Um, and it took me a while, but I actually found an ad agency 
and talk them into designing a campaign for me that would sell not just any vegetable, but arguably one of the more difficult vegetables for a lot of people, certainly my age. And I'm gonna show you, and not only that, but they allowed me to videotape their work, which went on for weeks and weeks as they did their sort of mad men and mad women genius thing and trying to come up with a way to sell this vegetable. So I'm gonna show you the first snippet here and we'll see if we have the sound. I do not like broccoli and I haven't liked it since I was a little kid and my mother made me eat it and I'm president of the United States and I'm not gonna eat any more broccoli. In spite of its well-known health benefits, broccoli is not a popular vegetable. It was derided by President George Bush, and it's pretty much ignored by the rest of us. I'm Michael Moss, and I write about the intersection of food and marketing for The New York Times. I'm trying to answer a question. What would it take to get people to eat better? The advertising firm Victors and Spoils, whose previous clients include Quiznos, General Mills, and Coca-Cola, took on the challenge pro bono. And the first thing they realized, of course, is they're not going to preach about broccoli. The government's been doing that. Lots of people are doing it. It hasn't budged our consumption at all. They're going to have some fun. They go, well, why don't we create like a little social media campaign here to begin with? Because you're not paying us any money, and we don't have any budget. And so we'll do that. And they go, we're going to pick a fight with another item in the grocery store. And I thought, great, you know, where'd those Cheetos go? <laughs> Just joking. Cheetos or potato chips. Um, uh, but no, they go, Michael, you forgot your own chapter about Coca-Cola, where, where we all discovered that the war between Coke and Pepsi was entirely bloodless on their part, because every time Pepsi got Michael Jackson to do a new commercial for Pepsi, sales of all soda in the soda aisle would rise as it brought buzz to the drinks generally. So they go, we're gonna pick a fight with somebody else. And here they are sitting around the little table actually doing their little mad men, women sort of ingenious thing. So our key consumer insight that we're working with is that everyone is currently talking about kale. Um, it is everywhere. This is Bon Appetit magazine. There's a whole section on the vegetable revolution in here. And there's a timeline around when all of these vegetables had their it moments. Broccoli is not on this list. There's nothing new or exciting to say about broccoli. Part of our challenge is going to be how to change the visual communication, the visual style of broccoli in culture. That wall over there says broccoli isn't exactly that cool. But maybe there's something cool in not being cool. Like you don't want to dupe anyone, but maybe, you know, maybe they're in on the joke. I mean, the fact that broccoli's having its own campaign, I think you could have a lot of fun with. The idea of like, you know, broccoli so you're basically saying, like, I'd like you to live longer. Here's something that's going to do that. So in essence, broccoli is probably a better gift than flowers. Instead of brocade. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the last line there always gets lost. This is how these guys get their genius juices going, right? Sitting around cracking jukes. So, so I did the story. Somehow I talked the New York Times editors and putting it on the cover of the magazine, even though it was entirely fictitious, fictitious right? company had just done it for the ad agency just did it for us but here's broccoli um, inside were some photos of some of their campaigns <laughs> the kale people are still calling me <laughs> not totally maybe getting the joke but 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 and that was it but then a couple of students um, at Yale picked it up and go, well, why should this be fictitious? We go to school in one of the biggest food deserts in the country, New Haven, very few grocery stores for a lot of poor people. They actually took this stuff, put it in stores, and in their scientific way, managed to double sales of broccoli within the first, uh, the first week. Um, one of the largest, the largest broccoli grower in the, in the east coast of the United States, then picked it up and went with this part of their campaign, the alpha vegetables, trying to turn <laughs> broccoli from a wallflower into a real powerful thing. Um, the Obama people came along and then did the next step, which was to get celebrities to start hawking fruits and vegetables. And that campaign is sort of still rolling out. Um, and not only that, one of the most amazing things I came across recently too is that some of 
my food giant executives are now switching sides to go to work to help some of this huge wave of entrepreneurial work out there where, where people with little tiny companies are trying to reinvent processed food to make it low cost, convenient, tasty, but healthy too. One of these people is none other than Jeffrey Dunn. Coca-Cola went to work for a carrot farm marketing baby carrots as junk food, stealing the ideas and the techniques that are used from the industry. The inventor of the Lunchables um, went to work on one of the grimmest corners of the, of the food system, the vending machine, and recently been, has been helping a guy named Luke Saunders, who's a whole talk in and of himself, um, scale up a vending machine that he has in Chicago that is selling this stuff. Um, which is hugely, hugely important if these small innovative companies can, can get past the initial invention and learn to scale up. Um, that is, uh, that's going to be a huge thing going forward. In terms of changing, last slide, our eating habits, including my boys here, of course, in <clears throat> our local grocery store.